Hello, my name is Monica Kretschmer. I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network and Woman of Inspiration Awards. This is the Women Driving Change panel. And I'm super excited to be introducing our three panelists today from diverse industries. So with me is Kim Roos. She is the CEO of the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter. Trish Guys, who is the divorce coach and strategist. And I've got to tell you, you're going to be, this is a nice combination to have today, as well as Judith Byrag, who is the owner of Clean Club Calgary. And what's so interesting is that all of you ladies are nonprofit, for-profit, coaching. You're all from a different area and industry, but yet you have one thing in common. You're all trailblazers in your industry, driving change for women. So welcome, uh, Kim. I'll get you just to jump in, do a little bit of an introduction, and um, introduce yourself. Sure. So as I as you mentioned, I'm Kim Roos. I'm the CEO of the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter. I have been there for just over seven years. And before that, I worked in the nonprofit area as well, working with homelessness, uh, children's issues, mental health and wellness uh, for 20 years before that. And so um, very proud to be at the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter. They do some great work. Uh, they're more than a shelter, and so a full continuum of services all the way from prevention all the way into intervention. Beautiful. Welcome, Kim. Trish, how about yourself? Hi, I'm Trish Guys, and I am a divorce coach, and I work uh, primarily with people that are in high-conflict situations or abusive situations. Um, people that are in those situations are near and dear to my heart. Uh, a few people close to me have gone through that situation, and myself have gone through that, and uh, those to me are the people that need it the most, and I find those the most uh, uh, interesting cases to work with. I have... Um, my previous life, I was in uh, human resource management and worked with a lot of conflict at, in the workplace, and that has sort of naturally transitioned me into uh, high conflict divorce coaching. Beautiful. Welcome, Trish. We'd love to have you here. Judith? Hi. Uh, my name is Judith Rag, and I own uh, Clean Club Calgary. And um, funny you mentioned your previous life, Trish. In my pre previous life, I was actually an executive assistant. And um, I just got a little bit tired of the accountability with big firms. And um, mm. I decided to start a cleaning business, uh, mostly for, um, for getting my freedom back to be able to travel whenever I wanted to travel. But it has grown, grown into so much more. And I, I am really proud to be providing jobs for people who are maybe shy or maybe they are new to Canada or they need an entry level job. And uh, I have helped a lot of people to come to Canada. So um, I think it's a perfect place for somebody to start uh, with cleaning if they are unsure as to what they want to do or how they want to get started or want to get experience. So. Beautiful. And ladies, I'm going to jump right in. This is the Woman Driving Change panel. And I guess my first question is, um, you know, this is the decade, I truly believe, for women driving change. And we talk about breaking those glass ceilings. I think it's a brick ceiling myself. But what was the turning point in your career or your um, career path, Kim, that actually empowered you to use your voice for change? Um, you know, I think there's a few turning points for me, but, um, I, well, I think one, uh, when I learned that 80% of graduates in my area of um, education uh, are women, but 80% of management jobs were men. And uh, so that was a big moment for me when I, I was like, well, that makes no sense at all. Like, shouldn't that be similar? And so I sort of uh, set myself on a path from that point on to learn everything I could about how to set um, the work apart and how to be, you know, not perfect, but excellent in what I did and in the, the work that I chose to do. And, uh, and so then just very carefully, methodically built my career that way. But it was, it was a real eye opener when it was like, okay, this, this, something is not right with this. In, um, in this field and it needs to change. And so have, I've really tried to um, you know, live that out differently and support women and provide um, and create cultures that support people to learn and grow and develop into their best possible you know, human beings in the workforce and at home, but yeah. Very cool. And Trish, what was that turning point for you? 
I had two. I had uh, a 12 year um, stay in an extremely high conflict divorce experience, all type of abuse. And I really struggled with that, but more, more so with the fact that I thought I'd never be in that situation. Strong, independent woman, came from a great childhood, great family. I, I, I couldn't understand why I was in this situation. And despite a lot of the resources out there, I wasn't able to make great headway oftentimes and it was such a struggle and I had a great support system and I would often think, you know, I have the the best situation possible in terms of support. I can't imagine how hard it is and can you imagine people who don't, whether they're new to Canada, whether they don't uh, have a command of the English language, they don't have the family support, they don't have a hope. And um, so I thought, you know, over the, the 12 years I have learned an incredible amount of information and uh, I just have a soft spot for people who uh, are in situations where there's such a power imbalance and I just feel compelled to uh, get in with them and to help them not to fix things, not to have them win. I know a lot of people want that. It's a matter of trying to make sure they can advocate for themselves and stop feeling like you have to stay small. And uh, part of the inspiration for that too was my paternal grandmother who had a very difficult childhood and difficult upbringing. But uh, that woman didn't let that stop her. And I just thought, you know, I owe it to her to not let what happened to me um, weigh me down. Mm. Beautiful. And Judith, it looks like we're wearing the same shirt here. Yes, of course. <laughs> Women seen, heard, and valued. I was going to say, nice shirt. So yeah, it's from you. <laughs> uh, yes. And so I'm just going to ask, what was your turning point? So um, I had three times in my life when somebody had told me that I either can do something or I'm never going to be anything. And I think that was a really, really big driving force for me. Uh, one particular time was, um, two particular times, actually, they were teachers and they were women. And uh, one said to me that because I'm an immigrant, I'm never going to amount to anything. And um, I, I don't know, it, it never drove me in a way that, well, I'm going to show you. I think it's just my upbringing um, where I come from is that I, I wanted to I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity that I was given here in Canada. And uh, I was told uh, this um, about three years ago when I started Clean Club Calgary. And I was told that um, I, they don't see me doing this on my own. And... Um, it, it just lit such a fire under my butt because um, I had hired previously a business coach and uh, he was telling me something very different. He was telling me that I can do this on my own and uh, I am good at this and I can run a company on my own. And, um, and that's, that was, was driving. And there's something very different uh, what Kim had experienced. I actually had experienced in my own family and in my, through my work life, very strong women that I look up to. And um, I come from Hungary. And in Hungary, actually, there's a lot of women in very high positions. And um, one person in particular is my aunt. And I have learned so much from her. She's got four degrees and a PhD. And the second language is Russian, <laughs> which I'm like, wow, because Russian in itself is crazy to learn. So I really look up to these women and they, they are always driving me to do better. And just the opportunity of living in Canada, people don't realize it. What, a, what an opportunity and what a great thing it is. So. So this is a really great segue into my next question, because according to, you know, these leadership surveys, 67% of women learn from other women. So what is the most valuable lesson, Kim, that you have learned from another leader? I've had some wonderful mentors over um, the years, and uh, one of them, Actually, uh, for so many years, I stayed in the second position, like the second in command sort of position in organizations. And, um, and she encouraged me to, um, to step 
out and step into my leadership. Other people did too, but she was really quite wonderful about it. And I'd always um, sort of felt that, uh, I think actually I was reading some of the stuff that you'd produced around the imposter syndrome thing and about um, like really being uncomfortable being out front. And I had spent so many years behind the scenes and, you know, making things happen, but never actually being out in front and setting the culture, setting the stage. And, um, and so she encouraged me to do that. And unfortunately, she passed away. And she had, uh, so this mentor had actually um, been the CEO temporarily of the Calgary Women's Mercy Shelter a long time ago. And so I'd always watched the organization. And then it was almost like things came into this perfect storm. Um, and then I, I interviewed on the anniversary of her death. And it was really, really powerful because I, I, you know, I'd watched Quest for so long. I've been very impressed with the organization. My education had been in family violence and abuse. And, um, and so I, for the first time in 20 years, took a risk and sent my resume in and thought, you know, we'll just give this a try. And then it all just came together. And I just, it was, I felt her like on the day that I did the interview, I knew she was with me and I knew she was encouraging me. And, um, and so, yeah, she just, she was someone that just was always encouraging people to take those risks, believe in yourself, step out, even when, you know, it's a little bit scary. And so it took me a while. I was a bit of a slow learner, but I finally did it. So anyway, so that, that was one of my big lessons was really, it's, you can, it's okay to take risks and it's okay to fail. You know what I love about that, Kim, is that sometimes we don't know the impact that we're making in the lives of other people, right? And, you know, how many years had you been watching her leadership mm -hmm. and she might not have known the impact that she was making, but yet how it had made a big impact in your life and your career. So I think that's really important for us as leaders to think about that constant consistency and the ripple effect um, that is created. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Trish, how about yourself? Well, I have a bit of a different answer in the sense that there have been a lot of women who have inspired me and I've learned a lot, but I have grown to actually watch men and how they do things and wonder why am I not doing them and why are we not doing them? Not because they do anything better, or, but, you know, for instance, why do I apologize all the time? Men don't apologize, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, sorry, I've been late or sorry, I'm no, 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 I, I've really tried to, you know, I, I recognize that we've been groomed since we were little to be polite and, and all that where boys, it's okay to, to burst into a room, even as a grown man, and, you know, no big deal. Um, you know, one of my husband's colleagues one time showed up late to a meeting, and he said, oh, sorry, he didn't even say sorry, he just said, oh, I, I am a little, was a little tied up because I, I hit a pedestrian outside. I mean, no big deal. Whereas <laughs> we'd be, you know, I, I would be falling all over myself apologizing, and I just thought, you know, um, I really want to be an inspiration to other women, particularly people like my daughter, who don't, I don't want people to feel anymore that you need to apologize for who you are, what you've done, mistakes. I really want to continue going through life feeling like I'm okay. I don't need to be like somebody else. I have, I have ADHD and I'm proud of it because I see it as a gift to be very transparent. One of my girlfriends said uh, not too long ago, she said, Trish, why are you trying to mold yourself into this box like everybody else is? Because that's not what you're gift is that's you're going to squash what is you which is that creativity and we need more people to think outside the box for lack of a better expression and um you know it's, that really resonated with me and and i've been really watching you know how men do it because not because uh, i want to be at the table but i just really want to stop being the stereotypical female where we're doing things that uh don't exude confidence when i, I feel inside but not portraying that and, and so I've really changed my ways over the years and uh, it has made a huge difference and I see it in my daughter where uh, she's 20 and she is not doing a lot of things that she used to do you can still be polite kind of considerate but not be uh, sitting back all the time and, and waiting for your turn you sometimes have to go get it because life is such that if you wait around for people to hand it to you it's not going to happen mm -hmm. Very well said. Oh, we've got lots to talk on that topic for sure. Um, and I love the fact that you're like, you're going to be the female leader that others are looking towards, but you've got your knowledge from another source, right? Which is completely interesting. I love that. Um, Judith, how about yourself? Um, 
Um, so tons of women that I learned from, obviously one being my mother. My, my mom is 73 and she owns a barber shop and she still works full time. So, <laughs> and uh, they always had the entrepreneur uh, blood in, in, in there. Uh, my grandfather used to use a produce store in communist Hungary that was entrepreneurship which was kind of unheard of and then my parents went off and did that as well so um, I definitely learned a lot from my mom I learned a lot from my aunt because she's uh, just <laughs> she she was the um, the CFO for the Budapest Zoo so I would go in and she would walk me through the grounds and it's amazing like this zoo is old and it's gorgeous and just how people were reacting to her when when they saw her, that respect, um, that fun, you know, that, you know, she was exuding and she has a great sense of humor. And then that confidence, exactly. And, and, and you know, anything. And then I saw her with her own boss uh, and how they were relating to each other. And then that respect was just so profound. And I, I learned a lot from that. And then when I was working for Citibank in Budapest, the uh, um, assistant general manager was a Hungarian uh, lady. And uh, the general manager was an American gentleman that I worked for, and uh, Maria was astonishingly smart, and, you know, I, I just watched the dynamic between this American and Hungarian, how they needed each other, and because he didn't speak a word of Hungarian, and the cultural differences, and all this, that she was able to guide him, and, um, it, it just was, I learned so much, so much, just, uh, you know, being diplomatic and, you know, just uh, being there for people. And uh, when people are very vulnerable, because the, the language situation can create actually a lot of very vulnerable situations. And, uh, and Hungarians tend to be pretty snobbish. <laughs> you know, our language and our country and our this, and we invented the world, literally, right? So it's hard for somebody who's from another country to step into that, right? So, so yeah, I learned a lot from these, these women and also men, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about those allies then. I think that's a really important piece. And I know, Kim, you and I have had conversations about that role, uh, and specifically in breaking that tie to you know, um, domestic violence and the role that men play there. So why is it so critical for men to be part of that conversation, not only in the home, the workplace and the community? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I'll tie this a little bit to um, family violence and abuse, if that's okay. Um, and, and then I'll sort of move it to leadership. But I, I think um, one of the most common questions that I get asked when people find out where I work they always say, well, so why doesn't she leave? And very few people ask, well, why doesn't he stop? <laughs> and so um, it drives me a bit crazy. But, uh, and so I, I really try and take the stance of, um, uh, you know, inviting everyone into the conversation for change. And, the, uh, and allies in, in my business are critical because, um, Social supports matter for when people disclose. It, whether or not they keep going for help, that first response really matters, as well as the social response for something that is not acceptable matters, right? And so those allies have an incredible amount of power in my world to make social change. If violence and abuse was not okay, it wouldn't be happening. <laughs> so it's, there are things that our, our society accepts, rewards, endorses, and, um, and so I think that the power of allyship is amazing, and the change that you can make when, uh, when you stand up for what's right and for what's healthy and, and make those moves is, is really, it can be quite incredible. And I think that um, allies are, well, when I look back at even my own career and my sort of journey through, um, uh, through my professional life, uh, male allies and mentors and supporters helped make room for me, right? And rather than judging or putting me in a corner or thinking that, you know, I couldn't contribute, they were supportive, encouraging, um, and, and created space at the table. 
and are still doing that, right? So, um, and I think that we all get further together when we're at that table together, right? And so I think, um, you know, I, I honestly, when I think about allyship, I really do go to the family violence and abuse. It's just, it's because I'm immersed in that. But I think that there are so many places where that matters that, um, you know, we do, and actually, Trish, your sign behind you, we rise by lifting others, right? I think that very much is, that fits very much for the allies in, in our world. Well, I think, you know, everybody plays a role to support her, right? Um, you know, definitely. And I, I really love how it's, you know, you've connected the dots that it's men and women working together. And I, I really feel that right now, even as much as it's women driving the change, I'm so excited about the inclusion of our allies in that conversation. So, um, Trish, um, what, what would you like to share about the importance of our male allies? Well, I think, you know, they do have an incredible amount of power. And I think when you have an incredible amount of power or wealth or privilege, you have a duty to step up that much more than others. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's male or female uh, or, or, or uh, what the color of your skin or what have you. We're living in a society, and if we want to succeed in a society, just like in a family, you need to step up. Other times, other people will step up for you. It's a give and take. And I, I think there's this misnomer sometimes of where men feel they need to come in and rescue. And that is absolutely not what we need. We don't need to rescue, right? We're not a damsel in distress. Uh, in fact, and oftentimes I think a lot of us are repelled by that. And then there's this vicious circle where, no, I don't need to be rescued. I can do it myself. And then I'm doing everything myself. And then we're getting upset because no one's helping us. And it goes on and on. But, you know, this concept of stepping up. And honestly, like what I expect is to be treated as I treat men to have that revere, have that respect because you're a fellow human being um, and that society is so much better and so much easier to handle and same within a family. If you do respect each other and support each other, it makes no sense to me to try and keep other people down because eventually it does trickle back to um, whether you want to believe in karma or the simple fact that everyone has a job to do in life but also at work and if you're not supporting that, eventually it's going to be a detriment to you. And I think we need to go way back to um, when our children are small. It was very important for me to um, teach my son what he, what is important or what should be important to him and what he should value and, and also how to treat women and to treat men, uh, really trying to get away from the toxic masculinity because I think men have a difficulty in the sense that um, – Still in this day and age, we're still expecting them to be this big, strong, tough guy, uh, take it on the chin, uh, don't show your emotion, and then when something happens and we need them to be soft, they're not, and we're upset with them. You know, we need to, I'm not saying we need to give them a break, but we need to be smart about this. And so the other day, there's an example of my father who was always uh, my biggest ally and my, uh, my sisters. My mom was fantastic, but my dad just came right in and always so didn't rescue, even though at times we needed it, uh, but he guided us. And so the other day, my daughter was dealing with an issue she had with a, uh, a grown man who was uh, trying to manipulate her based on the contract they had. And uh, so she asked my dad for help. And my dad had said to her, absolutely, I'll be there. You take it. You say everything you want to say. We'll have a code word that if you want me to take over and I will not interrupt. So that happened. And he... It was such an empowering experience for her because she wasn't by herself. She learned, but she was with a man who respected her. Didn't matter how old she was, she's only 20, but respected the fact that she's capable, but that I'm here to help, not to rescue, but to help, to guide you, because he learned many years ago and no one helped him. But now he sees it as a gift to, be, to have this opportunity to help other women. And he used to um, be in the Calgary Catholic School Board, and he took great pride in supporting uh, every individual there, but particularly women, that he had a great, strong relationship with his mother. And I think that went a long way to um, having such, the way he talks about my mother is my mother can do no wrong. And I tell you that just, if we had more men that did that, <laughs> I think we'd be better off. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Judith. Um, so I, I started early on. I started early on with my dad and with my grandfather. I was a bit of a tomboy and uh, my grandfather uh, had a shop and he was kind of like a 
Renaissance man. He could do a lot of things. And uh, we would, you know, he would just buy car parts and we put cars together, you know, and all the guys would come down and, you know, by the end of the day, they'd be all drunk and whatever. <laughs> We'd be still putting cars together. And I think what I learned there is I have a really good problem solving skills. I don't ever get scared or or anything like that. I just right away try to think of a solution. And that's a very manly thing, I think. And uh, I, I, just, I just come up with the weirdest stuff as to how to solve an issue that we have. And uh, so I, I started there. And then um, when I started the cleaning business 12 years ago, and I had a, about six years ago, I had a little bit of a, uh, I call it a business meltdown. <laughs> I didn't think I was doing anything right. I was um, not, I didn't have a really good team. I knew I was part of it. And then I hired a business coach and this business coach is a man. And um, he right away came in. Um, he didn't, he never intimidated me. He, he always uh, asked me questions that drove me to some really, really good answers, and he helped me to figure it out together. So I never had that feeling that a man comes in and he's, you know, what you had mentioned, Trish, you know, tries to solve the problem. He was with me and he was guiding me. And because of his knowledge, he knew more than what I did, right, at that point. And, and then slowly we started to solve these problems and, uh, and now I have a great team. I'm very proud of my team, and we have a we have good values, and we have um, we built all this up together. So I I really do think that some of these men allies are are crucial. And then lastly, my husband. I mean, you know, he was there with me yesterday in the yellow jacket, and he was taking all the pictures and and everything. And he loved the the sports cars there, so there was something for for the guys as well, right? So, um, but no, he he's always supportive, always, mm -hmm. and he's always by my side, and he'll be the first one to help me if I need help. Very cool. Well, I love how there, you know, we can talk about this now. I think that now we've already made such a big change by just talking about it, right? Um, and opening up that door, like you said, um, not as somebody to sort of, you know, rescue us, but to sort of help us navigate that through, like an advisor, right? Um, and so and a trusted advisor. But I find that most often it's, um, asking for that help so that's where I'd like to go next and I think that's a that's not always it's always easier said than done but you know how do you navigate over through that Kim about you know asking for what you want what words of advice can you share um, today about that um. Well, Judith, you, you mentioned the, the coach, right, the business coach. I think um, one thing I've learned is, well, I always have a coach now. I have been, I got someone that is a thought partner, advisor, supporter, whatever, someone that I can go to and be, um, uh, you know, run, playing with ideas and trying to figure out what's really happening for me and what I, where I need to go with something. And I think the other thing that I pair that with is, um, well, I call it radical self-inquiry, right? So spending, um, always making sure that I'm trying to understand my own inner work, um, my own inner <laughs> workings, I guess, and how I'm showing up and how do I um, impact others and how do I come across and how do I, um, you know, grow and become better um, today because, you know, you do the best you can with what you have. Um, and and then be really clear on my goals, right? Try and be really like, which is it's not easy for me. It's one of my challenges. I tend to um, want to do it all, and so really getting clear on what it is that is really going to make the difference and what's going to matter, um, and then and finding the courage and the language and and get the coaching to be asking for those things because you start to. I think I've started to learn that there are some things that don't matter as much to me, and I'm okay to let those go. But there are some that they do really matter, and so how do I um, uh, you know, come into those conversations, those relationships with others, uh, you know, professionally, personally, 
and be able to you know set boundaries clarify where i'm going and do it in a really respectful healthy way that is is um, aligned with who i'm becoming if that makes any sense and so it's it's um you know not a short answer to your question but i find that it's um it's a lifelong work really hmm. you know i i love about um your answer is that you know it's yeah it, it it's a journey. It's definitely a journey. And a lot of that, when they see a, a leader in a leadership role, you're opening up the opportunity right now by sharing this for another woman to actually be like, okay, I don't have to have it all. Like I'm not the only one that, you know, um, has struggles sometimes that has doubts um, and that there's this continuous learning that they need support. I just, I think that's so important for for us as women to know that we're just not alone in this whole thing, you know, and having it all. I mean, that's my next question, ladies, is about having it all. Like, really, I mean, we want to do so many things, but we've got to pick and choose what's best for us at the time. So thank you for that. Um, Trish. What, what both you and Kim just said is a great segue into what I was thinking that uh, I know we always want it all. And I think uh, because now we have so many opportunities and we want to create more opportunities, there's a sense of we think we can have it all. And I think we can, but I've come to the realization to be a bit more realistic. I know personally I can't have it all at the same time. So I've had to pick and choose. When I was staying home with my children, I missed out on uh, some uh, on a bit of my career. And I was fine with that. And I've learned over the years. And I, that's what I think we as women need to understand. Just because we're doing one thing and not doing everything at once does not mean we're missing out, does not mean less than. In fact, I think you're more than because you are focusing your attention on doing one thing well or two things well. I think we have stretched ourselves way too thin. We're having children. We're running businesses. We're doing all these things all at once. And we may be successful at it, but are we? Is there a health where it should be, is our mental health where it should be? Do we ever get to just watch trash TV? Do you, whatever you need to do to just be you. Are you even ever alone? Do you, you know, and, and I, I think we're just on this treadmill because we're trying to, it's almost like we're trying to make up for time. I know I experienced that after staying at home with my children. And, you know, my husband has been really a, a great beacon of reality for me because he's helped me over the years determine what Kimmy, you're saying is, is this really important? Because I was the type of person where literally everything was important. You can't live like that. Not everything is the hill you need to die on. And I, I guess I grew up thinking that if I didn't put my passion into everything, it's like I didn't care. And that's not the case. We just need to prioritize. And that seems so normal. But, you know, we often don't do that because when we have passion, we put it into everything. And then something does ultimately suffer. And uh, I'm now okay with the fact that Maybe there's tons of things I should be doing. Like, for instance, my house is probably filthy. Oh, well. Right? Like, it just, I don't care right now. You can come and help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Actually, I I'll contact you later. You know, we have to pick and choose. And instead of always worrying about how we look, you know, who do you want to be, what do you want to be? And I really like that people are becoming more transparent and talking about our stories so that other people don't feel they have to be perfect. I'm so tired of everyone on social media talking about how great things are. I love, there's this, I can't remember her name, but there's this one woman on Instagram who shows the Instagram pose and then the real pose. And everybody has roles when they bend over and things like that. And I think, you know, this is what we need. We need to start seeing humanity, not this plasticity. I am sick of that because I see my daughter and over the years she had suffered from these unrealistic expectations. And I, we just need to stop. And to be honest, we're our own worst enemy. Um, I've had my husband say many times, even my son says, mom, it's not a fashion show. They don't care. It's us who care, right? So we need to smarten up about that. Beautiful. Lots of knowledge there. Uh, Judith. Um, where do you want to jump in? We've got lots to talk about. Um, have well, it all. I, yeah, I, I really Trish, love this one. Yeah. Trish is, I, I do watch trashy TV, just so you know, because <laughs> that's what actually gets me off, gets my mind off of everything that's going on. And, um, so, uh, gosh, uh, where do I, where do I begin help? Um, yeah, I ask for help. I, I learned that now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, for example, when when I started to do Clean Club Calgary, um, I had to wear so many hats, and I knew I can do it all. I, I'll give you an example. Like, I can talk your ear off, but I can't put that into paper, and I can't write a blog. 
So I hire somebody, Lindsay, we, we all know Lindsay, and she's amazing. And it has come to a point now that where she does an interview, she sends me the blog, I literally have to know, do no edits. She knows me so well. So that relationship, oh my God, I treasure that relationship. If I, if I wouldn't ask for help, I would never have that relationship, right? And, you know, my social media, I used to do all my social media, and uh, I, I, I was getting really good at it. I was getting really good compliments. But it's just, it just takes a lot of time to create all the content, to come up with ideas and all this kind of stuff. So I asked for help. I hired somebody, Julie. You know Julie as well. She, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's just, um, I think uh, asking for help is being comfortable in your own skin that this is not what I'm not good at. Yeah. And I don't have time, energy, and money to develop this skill yeah. because I am so much better at these things and I want to focus on the things that I'm good at. So I think a lot of women are still struggling with that. And Trish, you're so right that we want to wear so many hats. And um, as, I, as I age, and I have to say, unfortunately, this comes with age, um, I'm just not so worried about it anymore. I admit, like, I'm not good at this. Or if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to go like, um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And that's okay. Because, you know, I'm not a walking encyclopedia, right? So, um, yeah, so just uh, on, on that one, definitely to... I, I do ask for help, and, and, I, and I love love all the help that I'm getting. Well said, Judith. And by the way, I love some trash TV as well. <laughs> I think secretly we all, that's it. We don't even need to think about it, right? <laughs> um, so anyways, yes, we can talk about what shows are the best. Um, what I would love to, this is really important, of course, you know, driving change, it has to start with our youth. Right. And so I would love to talk about empowering our future leaders. You know, Kim talking about like, how do we make that great, great big change? Right. We can't fix. We can't put the spilt milk back into the cup. But what we can do is start laying the foundation to make things better. So how uh, what words of advice would you give to empower the future leaders? Um, hmm. I think uh it's important to create opportunities for mentorship and growth and for feedback. Um, I think uh, it's such a social media culture right now. And so to your point earlier about the, the great post and then what was really going on, I, I love that because I think our kids have um, maybe a distorted view of, um, of the world, what it takes to make it. Um, and, um, you know, and, and maybe there's, you know, a little too many Netflix shows in there about, you know, what they think it's, it's like. Um, and so I, I think uh, it's really important to create those opportunities for our youth to um, learn and understand and, and learn how to understand themselves, right? So that not, because they're not trying to achieve some unrealistic expectation that isn't actually them from what they've seen on social media. But how do we help our kids um, you know, learn how to be healthy in relationships, learn how to become strong in themselves as they sort of figure out where they're going to be, you know, career-wise or, or in life, um, and, and being okay with that, with what it is. So uh, whether they're an artist or, you know, a lawyer, whatever that might be, like whatever their, their passion is, um, helping them see that there is beauty and strength in that and that there are um, – lots of lessons and things we can, uh, you know, impart along the way. But I think it really is opening up and creating those learning opportunities for kids that are maybe not the traditional learning opportunities that are, you know, school, but um, the ability to job shadow, mentor, um, be a part of um, groups that are like volunteering and, um, you know, they get to see like boards operate or whatever that may be, wherever their interest area is. I think that um, creating that sense of lifelong learning, Feedback is really important and, and stays with kids as they as they grow. At least that's what I hope. And I have I have three girls, and I I try really hard to oh, just your puppy. <laughs> um, I try really hard to um, you know uh, build them up, but also help them realistically build up and, and sort of learn themselves, right? And learn what they um, they have to offer in the world. And um, yeah, so I think that's what's really important that if we can do that for all kids, I think we'd be a lot further ahead. 
Well, I love that. Of course, we started January our peer-to-peer -peer mentor, like our peer-to-peer -peer jam and role model talks. And, you know, I, I still, you know, I talk about this. I didn't grow up with all of those really strong role models in my life, right? So look at what we are able to offer our youth by our experience some of the stuff we want to pass on, some of the stuff you're like, detour, do not go there. Like, turn left when you might want to turn right, right? Anyway, so um, I think that is really important. Uh, Trish, how would you empower our future leaders? I think it starts very young, and I think we. Uh, what I like to do is focus on the child's qualities and gifts and things that they and, and things they exude as opposed to what they do there's such a focus in society and who you know one of the first things we ask is what do you do as opposed to who are you you know or what lights your fire that kind of thing you know when their kids are little um they they have that sense of wonder and we're always so praising them for just even the tiniest little things and we lose that over time which is fine we don't want to, be, want to become praise junkies but i think um, somewhere along the way, we start realizing, ooh, we're only valued if we accomplish X um, or if we get that A. I think we need to really continue, especially as kids get to be teenagers, because oftentimes they get a bad rap. I know in my community, anything goes wrong in this community, people naturally assume. And honestly, more often than not, it's adults. I have had nothing but good experiences with teenagers, with wearing masks, doing everything they're supposed to do, holding doors open for people, helping nail Like, they're just wonderful. Um, and that that just speaks to parenting, I think, you know, and, and making them feel like they can do as opposed to always telling them and correcting them. It's what it's, it's okay to guide and correct. But I just think if you put yourself in their shoes, um, you know, if, if, if our boss treated us the way we sometimes treat our children, I don't think we'd be very happy. And I don't think we'd be very motivated to and be inspired to create. And I, I hate to see that light in people's eyes go out before they even become adults. We have no idea what they could have accomplished. And, and I think also um, mentoring, I like, you know, what we were saying earlier about mentoring, we should be mentoring our children too, and showing, uh, talking to them, being transparent about how we screwed up. Um, I, I do that all the time still, and I you know do it in a joking way, but it's good for them to see that we are not perfect, especially when the kids are little, and that and how we rectify things, or that we just don't know. Um, mm -hmm. They need to see that we're not infallible, and they need to see that it's okay. They need to see it's okay not to get it, you know. And and I think you know Kim, what you had said earlier is so key. We none of us are the same. There are there. I think there are more people out there that learn differently than the norm, then we realize. I, I was one of them. And my son was one of them, and he had a fantastic math teacher who understood him. It didn't matter what the right answer was at that point. He was in grade four. It was the process of the, the thought process. And he, for the first time in my son's life, um, he thought, oh, I can do math, instead of, I'm too dumb, I can't do math. You know, it's those kinds of things. It's just a slight twist. And I tell you, just like we are talking about the differences people have made in our lives, we need to do that for our kids. Hmm. Beautiful. And by the way, my son has ADHD, um, and so I see that as a, and I always want to show him the role models that are out there that are changing the world, and why? Because they think differently, and thinking differently doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, it's just a different way of looking at things, and that is a true gift. I am, like, I am right on that whole song sheet with you, Trish, because uh, embrace your differences. That's what we have to preach, preach, right? Yeah. Judith, how about yourself? How would you empower our future leaders? So this is, um, I, I always start with when I don't ever want to tell anybody in my time or how we used to do this or how I do this or anything like that. Because I always remember that I was in their shoes once. And I think we all tend to forget that. We sit on our high horse because now we're smart and we're aged and you're, we're refined, whatever. But we, we tend to forget that, you know, we were in their shoes once and we didn't know things. And we had that teenager brain that, you know, took us into a lot of trouble, right? So uh, I, I really do think that um, it empowering them is, sometimes letting them learn on their own skin. Um, I had a boss once that, you know, just do it and then beg me back for forgiveness later. 
because if you have maybe messed up, you know, uh, because I think what's happening nowadays, I see it in the business all the time is like, I go in, I want to show somebody how to do it, but I rather watch them see how they're doing it. So maybe I can correct a behavior or appraise a behavior because, oh my God, they're doing something so different than I'm doing it, but it's amazing. Like, how did they come up with that? And I don't think we got, give enough credit for, for, you know, when somebody so, does something different, but heck, it works. And you know what? It works better. So uh, I, I believe in that. And one firm thing that I learned, um, Jen, I took Jen's uh, uh, course. I read, of course, There to Lead by Brene Brown. I just love that book. And then I took the course with, with Jen Lofgren. And being clear is being kind and unclear is unkind. And if I think back to when I was young and how I was, I was growing up, you know, if somebody laid down the facts and told me, you know, uh, this is, you know, how to do it and whatnot. I tried to do it a bit, as best I, as I could because they were clear with me, right? Um, and even my own parents, like they would say, you know, this is my experience. This is what happened to me. And I think you're making a big mistake, but do it because you need to learn on your own skin. Very insightful, ladies. And I think this is how we're going to drive the change. I mean, so much knowledge to share. And, you know, if, you know, we move forward, I guess one of the biggest questions is, is how do we keep that conversation going? What are you going to do to drive change, Kim? That's a, uh, that's a really big question. Um, you know, I think um, for me, I, I, I'm going to try my best to use um, my organization, my role in that organization uh, to empower women, um, create those leadership opportunities. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in some ways. Our organization has, um, we have, you know, many women in leadership. And our, our challenge is actually sometimes the opposite, is trying to make sure that there's a balance because our cause draws women. Um, but um, I think, you know, driving change uh, we all have a role to play in that, and I think that I, I do have opportunities within um, my day-to-day -day work to be um, creating those learning opportunities for young leaders uh, that they wouldn't normally get. You know, I think uh, I was very lucky. Um, I had people that invested in me early or, or gave me those chances to learn, right, and to actually be involved in projects that I probably wouldn't have been otherwise. And so I think that's an important piece as well. So you always have like the education, very valuable, but to actually uh, give people that option and, and opportunity to be a part of things that they wouldn't normally get to be there, they learn, you learn differently, right? And then when you go for your next job interview or you're, you're trying out for different roles, you can draw on those experiences differently as well. And so I think making sure that there are opportunities, that there are lots, there's lots of openness for that. And, um, and I work very hard as well to try and make sure that everyone has the opportunity to get coaching or support. It doesn't matter where they are in the organization, but if that's what they're needing and looking for, finding ways to build that in, uh, in a sustainable way so that people can be um, choosing their path, I guess. Beautiful. Thank you. Trish, what are you going to do to drive change? Well, a lot of what I'm doing already, my practice is a, just a, a, a breeding ground for helping those to make change not only in themselves and in their lives, but for their children and uh, for other people around them. I think, um, you know, I have this great opportunity when people come to me, they are facing such great adversity and stressors and feeling like it's the end of the world. And then you have, they have children and they're trying so hard to protect them and it's a lot of pressure and I really take great pride in being able to show them not promising that everything will be okay because it often isn't and you can't predict what will happen but teaching them that despite the bottom falling out you were still going to be okay and this is how you're going to do this and this is how you can shore yourself up and yeah you're gonna to have to pick yourself up off the floor we all have done it and mm. it's hard and but you can't get away from it and to give them that sense of strength. And I also, I know this is a long-term project, but I'd really like to do some work eventually, and I'm not sure what this will look like, is going back and uh, 
helping kids learn or teenagers learn, men, uh, boys and girls, more about themselves and also developing that sense of uh, relationship literacy so that we can make a difference in divorce rates. We can't do anything uh, when we're already married. We need to start from the beginning and start being smarter about how we're entering into relationships. What does a healthy relationship look like? But even before that, to, you know, I look back in my 20s, I had no clue, in my 30s, I had no clue who I was. I just kind of lived through life, you know, 20s, there's nothing wrong, you're having a good time, 30s, you get married, have kids, mortgage, and then you wake up one day and think, this isn't my life, this isn't what I wanted in life, what's going on? And because uh, I didn't pay enough attention, I was too busy having fun and, and living my life. So, you know, like I said, I don't know what that looks like yet, but it's always bouncing around my head and how I can make a difference uh, early on in people's lives so that maybe one day I won't be divorce coaching anymore. I'll be doing something else that would be lovely. We wouldn't have to worry about it as much anymore. Pipe dream. A girl can always dream. <laughs> dream big, right? Uh, uh, there's a quote that's um, the people that, the crazy ones, right? The great big crazy ones quote. The people who are crazy enough to think that they're going to change the world is the ones that do. And I subscribe to that. So dream big. That's um, right. Yeah. So yes, I do believe that will happen because we're putting it out there. You're surrounded by people that will champion it. And of course, that align with those same sort of um, values, right? Which is really important. So thank you so much, Trish. Uh, Judith, how are you going to drive change? So I, I believe in consistency in everything in life, just being consistent with whatever you're doing. And uh, I think we tend to forget that. So um, I'm just going through a, um, a bit of a journey myself, uh, you know, the COVID weight. And I signed up with Noom and I've been doing it since April and slowly the weight has come off and it just showed me that consistency. So I really do think just being... Um, consistent in you know what you're saying how you're approaching things how you're dealing with um issues and and things like that just doing that continue doing that and then also just using the platform that you have created because we are all these women and we are exuding one voice one thought you know and uh, and i think it's a great platform and i think um, you, you'll, you'll understand when I say, you know, small steps, baby steps for everything. And then, you know, you might be in the hamster wheel and doing it and doing it and you feel like you're not getting any results, but then something happens and boom, you got big results, right? So I just want to continue doing that with this platform, with being consistent and, um, yeah, and I have big dreams too, Trish. I love what you're saying, but I... Eventually, I would really love to create a documentary about a life of a cleaner and what it's like, because sometimes we go through some very interesting things, like just how we are treated and good or bad, you know, and, uh, and I think that would also show people what my industry is and, and what it is to be in it day in, day out, you know, so yeah. Beautiful. I love all these big visions, and I think that is how we are going to change the world. And, you know, the world stopped during the pandemic, but women kept going. And I do believe in every cell in my body that women are going to drive change um, for the next decade and beyond. And it sure will with you leaders. And I just want to say, again, thank you so much for your leadership wisdom. Super excited for the world to read your stories. <laughs> I always believe in being authentic. So anyways, I had to pause for my dog to, you know, stop barking at the post at the FedEx man. But I, I just want to say that I really appreciate your vulnerability, your leadership, your wisdom. And I think that's how we're going to make change, right? And I'm super excited um, to be on this journey with all of you because Women are driving change. So thank you so much, ladies. And um, I look forward to the epic journey ahead. Thank you, Monica. Thank you.